Well, hi, I'm Phil Town. I'm Danielle Town. And we're here to talk about being invested all the way in. <laughs> <laughs> we're here to talk about these numbers that we've been talking about yeah. and how they can indicate soft information with hard numbers. That's what we've been talking about. Yeah, we're kind of working our way down trying to be ca- to, to see if we're capable of understanding a business, right? Yeah. That's kind of fundamentally rules of the game. And um, from Charlie Munger, who said that's the first most critical thing, is that we have to know that we're capable of understanding the business. So part of that is that you have to know that the business has certain qualities of intrinsic characteristics that make it durable and that management is the kind of people you want to put your money with, that you trust them and that they have integrity. So how do we know that? Like, that's so hard to know, and like in the management stuff. That it's we so kind subjective. Of, it is. It's, it's like you can think somebody's really a good person and what they are is really a good salesperson. <laughs> yeah, good, and, at, good at controlling their image. And a lot of CEOs are just like that. Yeah. They, this is not to say they're bad people, but they got to the top because they're really good at controlling their image. And, you know, it's a political game to get to the top of a lot of big companies. And they won the game. Yeah. So Charlie says that we'd like to have management that's talented and has integrity. Um, That's a big difference than requiring that we are capable of understanding, requiring that the business has uh, intrinsic characteristics that provided a durable competitive advantage, which we've identified in previous podcasts as as being really uh, key to what we call five moats, right? Five big moats that a company can have, which is <clears throat> the brand of the company can be a moat. It can be um, really difficult to switch off of their company. We were talking about IBM last time as having this amazing switching moat, so good that for the first time ever, Warren Buffett's putting his money in a technology company, or what, what looks like a technology company, mm-hmm. but really isn't. Mm-hmm. Um, and we have secrets moat, um, IBM actually has quite a, they file more patents than any company in the world. Is that true? Yeah. I didn't know that. They're the most patents filed per <laughs> year of any company in the world. Hmm, that's interesting considering our patent situation. Yeah. What uh, is our patent situation? Oh, that there are all these software patents in particular that uh, cover, are so broad that the patent office issued, they're just basically too broad. And so new technologies that people are creating, new software programs that people are writing, fall under these incredibly broad patents. And what they're coming up with are new ideas and new ways of using them, but really shouldn't be under an old patent from 20 years ago. But they are. I thought it was easy to get around somebody's patent. You know, you just change something. It's really hard. There's a whole patent troll situation. Have you heard about the patent troll situation? No. Oh. It's a whole thing. We could have a whole episode on the patent troll situation. Um, it's it's a huge problem in IP right now. I mean, is I is IBM who's IBM's filing and all I these patents? I don't know if IBM is a patent troll. I don't know any. I didn't know that they filed the most patents of yeah. any company. Yeah, it's huge. I mean, they have this huge lab. This has been going on forever uh, since probably Tom Watson took over. They really focused on R and D. Um, and I don't know that it's really resulted in a lot of success in terms of turning uh, patented ideas into real products. Hmm. Um, certainly not the case for the cloud. <laughs> they've, they're very busy buying their way into the cloud future, um, which is viable. It's a way to go as a business. But they did patent Watson, and nobody's been able to come around anything like Watson, which is this artificial intelligence machine. Is that the machine that beat a human in chess? It did. Okay. Yeah, that's the machine that beat a human in chess. And now they're applying it to healthcare hmm. in terms of helping doctors um, and PAs reduce the cost of healthcare by being able to learn more and more as you feed it more and more information. And ultimately, they think it can be a really good machine at a real good artificial intelligence at figuring out what's wrong with people. Interesting. I mean, it's a tremendous amount of what doctors do. It's just trying to figure out what's wrong with you. Yeah, right. Yeah. Well, I don't know if IBM is a patent troll. My guess is that they, well, my hope is that they're not. But what a patent troll does is it's a shell company. They buy up a number of software patents, and then they just watch new companies, watch startups. And as soon as there's a startup that maybe is creating something that would fall under one of their patents, 
they sue them immediately and essentially end up shutting down those companies because they're startups and they have no money. What's the purpose of being a troll if you end up shutting down companies? They get some money eventually from by liquidating that company. Or maybe they cut they get a cut. Or they cut a deal. They settle. They get a piece of And the uh, investors in that company will pay if they think that the startup is worth it. Wow. And it's really messy. Why can't these startups figure out that those guys country? Well, why can't the startups figure out that they're violating somebody's patent? Oh, well, to do a search, it's expensive. I mean, it's the same kind of thing I deal with all the time with companies asking me if they should do trademark searches. Yes, you should do a basic... This is not legal advice. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, you should do a basic trademark search, meaning like, Google it. See who's out there. See if the uh, URL is available. See if there's anything that sounds close to your product. Um whether you should do a full-on proper trademark search, which costs five, six, seven thousand dollars $7,000. I'm not sure that's the best use of your startup money at the very beginning. Wow. So right when you need the information the most, you have the least money. Exactly. And you may exactly. make a mistake. So you see it all the time that startups will start with one name and a year later, or six months later, or three months later, change their name slightly, or change their name a lot, because then at that point they have the money to do a trademark search. I have seen this on the Shark Tank. Oh, really? Yeah. They, the guys came in there and made a pitch to the Shark Tank guys, and Kevin or somebody, they, they just knew that there was a company out there doing that already with that name. And they said, do you realize you're using the name of this other company? Yeah. And it was like, uh, oops. Right. I mean, it's not intentional, right? It's not like these guys show up and are like, oh, we're just going to steal that name. Like, that's not what's happening. It's just that it's a good name and they came up with it and somebody else came up with it also. Yeah. It's no big deal. So, Well, well to, to sort of bring this back to, to what I do when I'm investing my money is I avoid that stuff. I, I don't want to get too close to startups, IPOs. Um, I, I don't want to be where a patent troll could come in and create havoc in this company I put my money into, right? So I want to have somebody who has got a really long track record and really doesn't need new technology. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's the better. thing. Patents are an issue even in really established tech companies. I mean, in tech companies. Apple and Samsung had a massive patent litigation. Yeah, but check this out. It's The keyword is tech companies. That's right. So that's what I was about to say, is you were saying last time, I think, that you avoid tech companies because, and Warren Buffett avoids tech companies. Yeah. Because is, they're changing so much and it's hard to tell what's going to happen with them. Yeah, tech um, companies are very dangerous. They, they operate on the basis of creative destruction which means they destroy their old product with their new product. And they do it intentionally, right? Otherwise, somebody will come along and destroy it for them. Mm -hmm. And so the iPhone 6 destroyed the iPhone 4, gone, right? And and the the 5 is kind of useless, but you can still use it. (laughs) But the iPhone 6, now that's the way to go, right? And here comes the iPhone 6 Plus S, which is going to make, you know, you're not going to buy an iPhone 6 anymore. You're going to get the S. Yeah. And then the 7 will come out. And, oh, man, I'm dumping my 6. Well, and Samsung's going to come out with the new Galaxy whatever, and maybe that blows the iPhone 6S e- out of the water. Exactly. And so you, you as, a, as an investor, you want to avoid uncertainty. Uncertainty is a critical... We haven't really talked about this that much, have we? The un- no. Uncertainty is really, really uh, a problem. And, and so to... To begin with, what we're saying is you gotta you gotta be capable of understanding a business, and Charlie's whole point is so that you are certain about the company. You 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 avoid the uncertainty of the future. And so look at Warren Buffett's portfolio, and it's insurance companies, it's chocolate companies, furniture, diamonds, mobile homes. Yeah, I mean, it's just these things where the, the the future is relatively knowable. And there's nothing in there that says, wow, you know, I sure hope we stay as smart as we are today so that we can survive another 20 years. That's really dangerous. And it's so tempting for beginning investors to want to run out, especially when we start talking about values, which we're going to talk about today. You start tying your values with the values of the management and the company. And the next thing you know, you're out there trying to buy Tesla. Yeah, but Tesla's awesome. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> but who's going to be the winner in the electric car race 20 years from now? Yeah, I don't know. Who knows? Know. Who knows? And yet people are pouring their money into Tesla right now. It's a little bit like Warren Buffett was talking about the airline industry. He said that, that you know, it would have been great if somebody had come along and just shot Wilbur Wright before he ever got going. Why? So that nobody ever invented the airplane because it's been a black hole for investors. The airline industry has been Wait, a black Orville? hole. what about Orville? I don't think Orville made any money on it either. <laughs> I, you know, really, it, it's it, there are some industries where you can speculate about the future of the industry, um, but it's so disrupted and so full of uncertainty that you really don't want to be an investor in it. With tech companies, it's because they have to destroy the old products. And you never know for sure that, you know, never mind Samsung, you know, they're on Apple's radar. There's some guy in Silicon Valley in a garage that they're really worried about who might be inventing something that just blows everybody away. And we hope so. And we hope so. That's good for our economy. It's good for our world. It's Absolutely. It's good for us to keep on in I mean, the iPhone, when did the first iPhone come out? Like 10 years ago? Is that right? Gosh, Is I don't it even remember. that long? I mean, I'm, I'm an absolute phone, you know, like, what do they call it? Like a smartphone maniac. Yeah. I bought every one of them. And none of the, I never liked any of them. And then the iPhone came out and it was game over. Oh, but I mean, right, because the iPhone changed everything. Yeah, it changed everything. It there finally were no worked. smartphones before the iPhone. Yeah, there were. No. Oh, yeah, well, they're not there as smart as the iPhone. There was a Palm Pilot, which was not a phone. I tried it. But it wasn't a everything. phone. But I, there, was, there was like and there Samsungs. And there were phones. And there were Samsungs. But they were not smart. There was no smartphone well, before the iPhone. Okay, um, we, we'll, we'll stipulate. Let's stipulate. <laughs> we can... <laughs> They're I'm not right very about, smart. I'm I know right that. Whatever I was, whatever I was. Because buying. it was the first touch screen, so everything else was just a small screen, and you had to you you could text, you could but you around. had to scroll through your numbers. Remember, you had to go like J K L to yeah. get to L. Yeah, uh, it was crazy. It's like trying to find a movie on Netflix right now or <laughs> iTunes. It just makes you Except crazy. Except it was worse. Yeah. yeah, no, but I think the iPhone was the first smartphone, and um, and that was because. Steve Jobs came up with a completely new technology you know that, the, that nobody else was doing and nobody else was creating, as far as I know. As here's as how know. hard it is to invest in tech and get it right. Jobs looked around for the best company to partner with to do a phone, and he went to Motorola. They cut a deal with Motorola and said, okay, you guys develop the iPhone for us, and it'll be awesome, because we don't do phones, right? We're just computers and iPods and stuff like that. Motorola came back with this phone and Jobs did his Steve Jobs thing and just threw it away. So it was ridiculous. And they broke their contract with Motorola and went out and developed their own phone. And come on, Motorola couldn't figure out how to do an iPhone after Steve Jobs told him how to do it. So well, tech it, is tough. Yeah. Tech is tough. It's tough. So point is, we want to stay in this, what Buffett calls the circle of competence, what we call the canyon. Be in the area that you can understand. And part of that process, what we're kind of going through now, podcast after podcast, is unwrapping the things you need to know, which is a very limited number of them. We've talked about the growth rates on sales, earnings, cash flow, and book value. Um, we've talked about return on equity and return on invested capital and how that relates to debt a little bit last time. Um, and we just summarized really quickly here. Basically, you want growth rates to be 10% or better consistently over time. And you want the return on equity, return on invested capital to also be 10% or better. And 15% would be good, really good on ROE, return on equity. And we'd like debt to be payable in like three years of, of, of cash flow or earnings. Just pay, be able to pay the debt off quickly. And if it's more than that, it starts to get to be excessive and we start to worry about debt being a really a component of the company that could kill it. So those are all, you're right, we've talked about all of those things, very true. I'm stuck on this tech company thing <laughs> because I'm trying to get interested in this and I'm not interested in furniture companies and I'm not interested in whatever else Warren Buffett invests in. Diamonds. Yeah, fast food, you know. I mean, okay, so fine. Like, maybe I can be interested in some of those things. But what I use constantly and what's fun and exciting are all the different tech things going on and all the new tech things coming out. So 
I'm I'm thinking as we're talking about these numbers, is there a way that we can make it work for a tech company? Which yes, granted, I don't know where those are gonna be in 10, 15, 20 years. Right. But have we gotten to the point where you know tech has been around long enough where Google runs a lot of our world? I would feel pretty comfortable saying that Google's going to be... I would feel probably equally comfortable saying that Google will be around in 10 years just as much as some furniture company is going to be around in 10 years, if the numbers are there. And I don't know if they are, because I haven't looked at Google. Ah, Google's got great numbers. So what's the problem with that? Why can't I invest in Google? Because um, because I want you to win <laughs> <laughs> when you invest. And... Unless you're an expert at search and whatever else Google is getting into, what you're really investing in in Google goes home every night in their cars. They, they all, the whole future of the company gets in the car and goes home. That's a fair point. And that's scary. Because if they could go home, they'd get up the next morning and go to work for Bing. And right, and, and yeah, I mean, I see acquisitions regularly of tech companies that are just for the people, and they ditch the product as soon as the company is purchased. That's it, that's it. So let me let me give you some hope here, because you, we want investing to be fun, not just profitable, but we want it to be profitable, okay? So we're gonna teach you to be very profitable with your investing, and, and but because we all wanna have some fun with it, we created a little thing called the Risky Biz Portfolio. Okay. <laughs> Which is 10% of our portfolio overall. Okay. Yeah, that, you know, it's something we have not talked about that a lot of people ask me about is how to allocate a portfolio. So that's something we should talk about. All right. Let's talk about that next. Okay. Let's talk about it. Next. Because we're just coming to the end of the numbers right now. So yeah, it's a good yeah. thing to talk about allocation of capital. So the next podcast, let's do that one. Okay. How you allocate capital. But one of the ways you can allocate it is to put a small portion of your portfolio into things that you really, really love. You know, like Tesla, like Google, like Apple, the things you're using every day in tech, and and a little bit roll the dice, but do it in a really intelligent way. Do it with the numbers. Now, all, the only difference is where we want to be able to look out 10 years and see that 10 years from now, this company's going to be rocking and rolling. You know you just can't do that. You don't know where they're going to be. So you're just going to have to say, look, I'm putting the money in here, and if this thing starts to go south on me, I'm going to pull it out. If there's a change in the story on this company, I'm going to pull it out. Mm -hmm. And hopefully you pull it out after you make a profit, right? Because the story can change so fast in, in tech. It's crazy. Um, I mean, the, 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 what was tech in 1960 almost is all gone today, right? But, you know, that's, that's a, a way. So I would say if you do it right, you're, you'll be okay. And I would say the companies you just named, which are Apple and Google, both have a quality that's uh, a different kind of moat than the secrets that they create. Right? Yeah, I would say they have a switching moat. They have... Particularly Google. They have... Really, you think Google's got a big switching moat? It's trying to build one, I know that. It tries to lock you in. Everyone I know has a Gmail email address. Oh, that's a really good point. That's a big switching moat. It's huge. Yeah. That's gigantic. Yeah, I just yeah, realized I I've you, got one too. I think you think of search. I don't, yes, obviously I Google stuff. I search for stuff on Google. But that's not what I think of when I think of Google. I think of email. I think of, I think of email. <laughs> that's what I think of. I mean, there's all the other things that I access through my email, like Google Docs and Google, Google Drive and Google Voice. All of I are, access all of those by going to my Gmail and then clicking on those other options. You know, I'm still over here with Microsoft on most of that stuff. You know, are you serious? Yeah, I still Wait, use Microsoft, Microsoft Word and oh well, yeah. You know, Excel and you know, I'm still over there. Um, and Google's tried to make inroads with just free apps. You just get them. You yeah, know. I mean, they're not going to compete with a but full they're not on. No, but it's just for sharing. It's useful. Yeah, it is useful for that. Um, but my, you, you you made a really good point, and and I have to consider that in the context of of this this moat that they've got, which you know technology is typically a, a secrets moat, right? We figured out the iPhone, you can't figure it out. Um, 
but both of these companies, Google, when you start thinking in terms of doing something in the name of that company, that's a brand. Yeah. That's a giant brand. And brand moats are very, very powerful. Um, so I think in terms of Apple products, Apple has a brand moat because I think, I don't even think about doing a Windows product because it doesn't fit my environment that I've got. You mean buying a Windows product? Yeah. Like a, like a Windows computer or something? Right. Oh, yeah. Not going to happen. Not going to happen. I'm not going on Android, I'm not, which, is, which is Google. Well, that's what I mean with the switch emote with Apple because all Huge. of my stuff is Apple. Yeah. Frankly, I think they're kind... I think I said this. I don't think that they really have their mojo anymore, uh, which is sad. Um, and I've thought about switching because I know a lot of people who really like their Android phones. Really? But it's a real pain and I just don't have the time. I am not... I'm, I cannot stand having to deal with an interface that doesn't just work. Yeah. And I, I don't want to get involved in the interface. And so for me... I, I just had to load Windows on my machine because one of the brokers that I use only does Windows. Their platform only runs on Windows because they have all this, uh, talk about a switching mode. Yeah. They're on Windows because they can't take their apps and put them on Mac. It's well, just too much Excel, work. Well, I'm told, <laughs> um, works much better on Windows. Like there are features to Excel that just don't exist on the Mac version of Excel. So if you're serious about spreadsheets, you have to use Windows. You sort of have to use Windows because so they hold it. I think you genuinely in. have to because yeah. there, there are well, literally features. If I want to use this one one particular broker, I've got to use Windows. So on my Mac, I went and got Parallels. But then there's other stuff like design software, which only works on Mac yeah. and really isn't available on Windows or doesn't work as well. And honestly, most of the stuff I do isn't using anybody's particular program to such a deep level that I you know it's all windows and mac it's it's on yeah, both yeah. i do excel and word you know that's mostly what i'm working with and so when i discovered i had to do this thing on windows i'm like oh man what do i have to do so i had to go out and get this thing called parallels or i could do boot camp on a mac and but i'd have to shut down my mac and reboot it every time i wanted to get on this program so i went with parallels which could leave my mac open and i now i got to go load windows so I okay. load Windows okay. onto the thing. <laughs> How'd <And> that go? <laughs> it was horrible. I thought it was going to be really easy. On And I've got multiple Macs, right? So on my notebook, it worked fine. And so I click on the little Parallels button, and Windows comes up, and then I can load up this broker. I go over to my, my big Mac, you know? Your desktop. The desktop. And I click on the button, and Windows screen comes up and starts to load and then disappears. And I cannot find it. I can't find the C drive. I can't find anything. It's just, <laughs> I have no idea where it's gone. And yeah. so it's so frustrating. And there's only so many times you're going to deal with that. Yeah, right? and then I'm just And then you're done. It. Forget it with the broker, okay? Yeah. So what, what I were saying here about Apple is they have an environment, an integrated ecology or something where everything works together. It's kind of like the genius thing. And it's like you you... You get that, and what you get for that is a moat that's a switching moat, straight up. It's just really, really a wonderful moat. And that's what IBM has, that's what Apple's got, and it's, I'm a little surprised, but I think you're right. I think Google does have that because of Gmail and so on. So those things get it out of the world, the scary world of tech. Well, it's still, it is still tech, though. I mean, if, if somebody like the iPhone you know, everybody was behind BlackBerry before the iPhone, right? And then all of a sudden, or maybe over a few years, oh, that was that's a BlackBerry really, disappears. Talk about so a, maybe a maybe moat. it's the same with email. Who knows? Like maybe tomorrow, some fantastic new email is going to come out, and it's going to be worth it to forward all of your email to a new email address. Yeah, I don't know, yeah. but it's a switch. It, the the it, main thing is you recognize that you're moving into this area that's risky. Got it. You yeah. recognize it, yeah. okay? So and then so and then do it. Have fun. I mean, let's talk about Tesla for a second. You know, what's their moat? Cool electric car moat. I don't know. <laughs> they have a brand, right? Number one, and they have some kind of secret thing going on in order to develop these batteries and the systems that they've got and make a cool car and get it done. Um, but do you think that'll last in the car industry? Like. What thing in the car industry has remained a secret that all the car companies didn't get? And so you've got companies like yeah, Mercedes I I, and I mean, Toyota. I, I genuinely don't know the answer to this. Is it really that they have like patents that are 
I don't even know if they've got pads. Because all you have to do is buy a car and reverse engineer it. Exactly. Right? So how long is it going to... Not so only that, but, but Tesla is going to... I trying to have a secret. Tesla is going to make cars for Toyota and Mercedes. While Toyota and Mercedes learn what they're doing and decide whether to enter the market with their own car. It's crazy. So I don't know, I don't know what Tesla is worth. And that's what this comes down to. Is that we ultimately have to understand the business well enough to talk about what is it worth as a business. And we definitely got to get to that. That is a cool thing. So when we look at a business, we really look at what we call the four M's, right? Meaning of the business, that is, do I understand it well enough? Am I capable of understanding? The mode of the business, what's the intrinsic characteristic that makes it durable? The management of the company, are they giving me good ROE that's consistent, ROIC that's consistent? Do they share my values that I have personally? And we've talked about all that. And then finally, margin of safety. And what Charlie said is you got to get it. Ultimately, you can't pay an infinite price for a company. Remember when he's saying that? Yeah. And so, and, and we talked a little bit about what he means in terms of an infinite price and, and what their view of the market is, which is essentially that the public markets sell for about double what the private markets sell for. And Buffett and Munger don't come in and out of companies, so they don't care about liquidity, which is what gives public companies such a high value, is the ability of fund managers to move in and out quickly. And also, the requirement on public companies to disclose all this information. Well, Munger and Buffett know what they're doing. They can look at a private company. They don't have to worry so much about somebody hiding something. And they're not, they don't care about liquidity. So they're not willing to pay a public price for a private company, or excuse me, a public price for a public company. They want to pay a private price for a public company, which in effect would be buying companies at an extremely major league discount to what they normally sell for. So that's kind of what this all leads to. The ability to figure out the value of this business so you know what buying it on sale would look like. Mm -hmm. Right? Okay, so let's talk about ROIC since that's part of it the next number that we need to get to right that's really let's just stipulate <laughs> that we want ideally debt to be zero okay keep things simple at the beginning here let's just go for companies that don't have any debt or maybe a little debt but not almost no debt so a little debt means you look at their earnings and if their debt's bigger than that that's too much let's just keep it simple so debt less than earnings. Yeah, debt less than one year of earnings. Okay. So we're being a little hardcore here. Uh, we actually buy companies that have three years worth of debt. But just as you're beginning, just let's get debt off the table. Let's just not buy companies that have debt, particularly now when companies are loading up on debt because it's so cheap. So let's, let's stay with companies that don't ever have to refinance that debt someday at a higher interest rate and they get their butts handed to them. So let's stay away from debt. And that means that ROE and ROIC are going to be almost the same. Because return on invested capital, as I said last time, is just return on equity, excuse me, is just equity plus debt divided into earnings instead of just equity divided into earnings. So essentially it's saying, let me see how you're doing with all the money that I've given you and all the money that, you know, if I own the company, the company owes. Combine it all. Tell me how your return is. So let's just so make it if simple. So you totally liquidated the company. Is that right? Well, paid no. Paid off the debt. Say it again. So if you pay off the debt, yeah. you sell the, the equity of the company yeah. for X amount. Yeah. And then you divide it by the earnings for some reason. No. I don't know where I'm going with no, this. No, no. <laughs> totally. <laughs> Never mind. Okay, let's definitely redo that part. No, I'm, I'm, I'm kidding. We don't redo anything here on this podcast. This is rocking and rolling because see, I, if I can start to see where the wheels come off the wagon with these numbers, then I can make them clearer what they really mean. No, yeah. I mean, I get what invested capital is and right. I get that we're trying to figure out the return on it. Right. So you don't have to sell the company so, off or so anything. So I went to selling the company, but okay. Yeah, yeah. So it's just simply, just think of return on equity and return on invested capital as like the money you're making in your savings account. It's the return you're making in your savings account. So you have a certain amount of money in savings. But I don't have debt in my savings account. What are you talking about? 
Well, if you borrowed some cash from the bank and stuck it in your savings account, you okay. would. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough, I and, guess. And that sounds kind of crazy, but that's exactly what businesses are doing. They're borrowing money from some bank, and they're sticking it in their account, and then they're using that to go out and make a return. And the return on that money is called return on invested capital. To distinguish it from, we didn't borrow any money, mm -hmm. or we're not going to count the money we borrowed, mm -hmm. just how are we doing on our equity, the money we already had in the bank account. Okay. Okay. Kind of okay? Yeah. All right, so, we're, but we're gonna simplify this. Down to return on equity and return on invested capital numbers should be almost exactly the same. And the reason I wanna do that is because return on invested capital is a little more difficult to find accurately because so many different investors calculate it differently. Oh. People use net operating profit before taxes, they use earnings before taxes, the EBIT, they use earning after taxes to calculate it gets so you see our return on invested capital or return on capital and they be calculated a lot of different ways we're, we're talking about minor differences here but it may you know why, why not even why just make it simple and let's just not do companies that have debt but if the changes are on how you calculate your earnings no not how you calculate your earnings they're how you're calculating well yeah, with said, return on invested capital, it can be we're not going to count earnings as regular earnings. We're we're getting way out in the deep water here. I can feel it. I can look at I look at your eyes. Well, you said EBIT, which is earnings before interest and taxes. Interest and taxes. And they do use that sometimes. So, let's just say stipulate that return on invested capital, if you ever see that number anywhere, and return on equity should be very close to the same in companies you're investing in because you're not going to invest in companies that have a lot of debt. That's simple. We we'll just right. stipulate. Keep debt out of it. We're just beginning as an investor here. You don't need to be trying to figure out how good a company this is if they've got debt. Because debt makes you fragile. Debt makes it, like in 2009 when the financial system kind of froze up, and suddenly you couldn't get new loans, really good companies went almost belly up. They had to go and declare bankruptcy and come out and restructure their debt because they couldn't refinance anything. Hmm. I mean, big real estate companies had that happen to them. You know, so these it, it, if there's debt, just let's just stay away from it, if there's any significant debt at all. Okay, so, so takeaway is just make sure, so ROE, is that sort of a generally available number? That's a really generally available number. That's so ROI, everybody's got ROIC that. is a little less generally available. And the problem is they calculate it different ways. Okay. So if you're lucky enough to have both, they should be Pretty relatively close to the, same. the same. ROIC will always be this, the same as ROE if there's no debt or, li or a little bit less if there's a little bit of debt. So if your ROE is 15% and your ROIC is 13%, there's a little debt in there, but not enough to worry about. If your ROE is 15% and your ROIC is 7%, then there's debt that you have to worry about. So let's just not do companies that have a big difference between those two numbers. Okay. Good. All right, so now what we've done is we've kind of accomplished the three management numbers that we really have for looking at management objectively. So let's kind of summarize again. If you've got ROE of 15% or better, you're doing great. And you the thing is though, you don't over want it to many, be going down. Over many years. Yeah, over many years. And it's not coming down. It wasn't at 20 and now it's at 15. Okay. Because if it's at 20 and now it's at 15, management is going out and buying things with that money that are very likely, that they're very likely paying too much for, especially in this market. There are companies buying other companies like in world record numbers right now because debt is so cheap and, and, and they're paying too much for them because debt's too cheap. So their ROE is going down. And that's a big red flag that something bad may be happening here to that company. Okay, so ROE staying the same or going up. Yep. 10% is okay, mm -hmm. not amazing. Right. 15% is great, we're yes. happy. Yes, Okay, so that's the first number. Yep. What's the next one? Okay, then ROIC is gonna be very close to that, right? 
very close to that, same rules. And then debt is going to be something you could pay off in about one year's of earnings. Got it. Okay. So it'll be very low, very low debt. All right, those three numbers tell us that management is, if they are operating where those numbers are good, then management is operating probably pretty strongly to our benefit. And it sounds like ROIC is a little bit of a shaky number because maybe we can't find it. And even if we can, we don't know if we can trust it because you just said there's a whole bunch of different ways to calculate it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, just confirming. Yep, just confirming. And unfortunately, you're going to run into ROIC on companies like Whole Foods, which is out there doing you know a lot of construction on on grocery stores. And it's just it's going to take some nice companies off the table. But let's just stay. We want it. We want to start simple, right? Let's walk before we run. <laughs> all right, fair enough. For all of us toddlers out there, <laughs> I you know. Thank you for that comparison. <laughs> I don't want you to fall down and skin your knee. It bothered me enough when it happened to you for real. As a little kid running around skin your knee, oh, I always dear. feel terrible. This whole learning new things, it's tough. I know it's tough. It's tough. But as much as possible, we're gonna have, we're gonna teach you to ride the bike, but we're gonna have some training wheels on it. <laughs> So you don't go too fast and you don't crash. I just want to skip the training wheels. I just want to go straight to the motocross park. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Everybody does. And, oh, my gosh, the lessons people get from that are horrendous. I hear stories all the time, you know. I was doing this, doing this, doing great, and then bam. Yeah, yeah. Gone. Right, right. Gone. We don't want any bam gone. Yeah. We're, our, rule number one is all about not losing money. We want to focus on that. And if you follow... What Charlie and Warren have taught us, you're going to be fine. You're not going to have a bam and gone. You're going to be you're going to be good. So let's go on to the next piece of this thing, which is hugely important, and that is matching our values with the company. This is just absolutely critical. When we think of like, I like to think of things like a simple way of thinking about how to look at an investment, and I use this acronym Ruler because okay. it's just cool. It fits rule number one, right? <laughs> and it starts off with, you know, how did this company get on my radar? That's the R, right? Where did where did I pick this up? Did it come from my own passions, my own spending of money, my own talents? Where did, where did I get this? Or am I just, you know, picking up a tip from my buddy? Okay. So how does it get on my radar is really okay. important. Then the second thing is understanding the business, which we're, we've gone through uh, to a certain degree here. We've gone through meaning, moat, and management. We haven't talked about margin of safety, figuring out the value yet. We're going to come to that. Um, then the next step is to love the business. That's the L. Love the business. And by that, I mean have a connection between your values, your heart, where you want the world to be down the road, and, and, uh, and your value set and, and the business that you're buying. Treat it as if you own that business. You're the 100% owner of that business. And even more, treat it as if it's the only business you own. So as we're just starting out here, we're this is training wheels, okay? We want to buy that first one as if this is the only business I'm ever going to invest in. Like, oh. like I'm a hardcore entrepreneur. Like the, the people you work with every day yeah. are coming in your office and are going, this is my baby. And the venture capitalists look at them and look them right in the eye and say, how deep in this are you? Are you all the way in for 80 hours a week? Is your family good with that? Can your kids handle it? Are, are you thinking that you're not going to end up with every cent you own in the world in this business? Because you're not. Everything you well, own is going to be in this business. I disagree with that particular point. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but it always happens. Mm, it's like, try man. Try not to. Don't do that, everybody. Yeah, don't do that. But it always happens. It's like, man, alive, here comes this unexpected thing. And there goes your last nickel. As you well know, hmm. because I put Danielle's college money into investments, but it came out okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so E, what's E? E is huge. E is where we get into the understanding of the business's value and price, because E is event. Okay. Now, it's real important to understand something. We're trying to buy businesses that are on sale. So the all the things we're talking about so far is to figure out if we know enough about the business to be able to figure out what it's worth. Because if you don't know what it's worth, you don't know if it's on sale or not. The fact that it went from $60 to $33, like Whole Foods has recently, doesn't mean it's on sale. 
It just means it went from 60 to 33. That's all. It's pr really important to understand this. Price of a business is just what you paid. It's not what it's worth. It's not what you got, right? What you got is its value. What you paid, man, I don't know, you might have got a super deal, you might have been just stupid and paid way too much. Remember back in 1999, people were paying 11,000 years worth of earnings to get into Yahoo, <laughs> which is insane. Is that right? true? Yeah, Yahoo would have had to grow For Yahoo. For Yahoo. In other words, people thought Yahoo was gonna grow so fast that it was worth this insane PE, this multiple was 11,000. And if they'd bothered to think about it for even a minute, they would have realized that the growth rate to justify an 11,000 PE would have had to mean that Yahoo would be the entire gross national product of America within the next 20 years. <laughs> that every dollar you spent was on Yahoo. You didn't eat, you didn't drive a car, you didn't buy gasoline, you didn't put your kids in school. You just bought Yahoo, whatever they were selling, which is, of course, ridiculous. And of course, nobody actually thought that. They were buying it as a speculative investment that it was going to go up for no reason. Exactly. And they it went up before. Else, right? Yeah, and I'm only going to be in it three months. Remember, fund managers are only in these things for three or month, two or three months. So they didn't really think like that at all. They didn't think in terms of how crazy is this price. Right. All they thought was, you know, hey, those guys made money on it. And it's still going up. Right. I'm just going to be in it three months. You know, and of course, somebody's always left with this game of musical chairs yeah, without a chair. Exactly. All right. So exactly. we want to not be that guy. And so what we want to do is we want to understand the value of this business. And remember that price is just what you pay. And the fact that Whole Foods was selling for 60 and now it's at 33 doesn't mean it's on sale. So this event one, what are we, what kind of, event, are we looking for an event that has changed the price, an event that has changed the value, an event that... We want... What if there's no event? If there's no event, be very afraid. Oh, if you think this is on event. sale, yeah. So, well, here's what we, when we get around to event, we're basically saying, okay, what we want to buy is a company that we know the value is, let's say, fifty dollars a share, and it's available to us for twenty-five dollars or less. We want a fifty percent discount to its real value. Okay. Now, in the real world, people don't sell stuff worth fifty dollars for twenty-five dollars. They, real, I mean, smart people don't do that. And you're dealing with really smart people who run these mutual funds and who have 85% of the money in the market. So what in the world would cause them to make this incredible mistake of selling something worth $50 for $25? Why would they ever do that? That's where an event comes in. Because these guys are mostly investing very short term. If there's something that happens to either the company uh, the industry or even the entire system, right? The whole world has an event that can affect their view of where the price will be in this company in the next three months. And if they think that event is going to take the price down over the next three or four months, they're going to exit. And it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Clearly, it's, it would be an event that we don't think would uh, affect the long-term prospects of the company. Though. The long-term what? Well, I said prospects. And that is, is that also, right? yeah, you're right. But that translates into the long-term... Price? Not price. Don't we care about the, the price since we're going to have to... No, I know, I know what you're going for. We don't care for, about I, the price. But I think it's price because no. we have to sell it eventually at no, a price. Not necessarily. Um, we'll, we'll be discussing trying to buy investments mostly that we never sell. That's what we want to load All up right. with. All right, okay, now we're on a whole other, for investments we're never gonna sell. What we want to know is, has the value changed? Because if the value hasn't changed, but the price has gotten cut in half, bingo, that's what we want. A company that's value well, that's what is I was good. Saying. So if, if, if the long-term prospects. prospects of the price of the price. Because we have to sell it at a price. But use my terminology. So, for example, mm, the value of the company is yay, like it's really good. 50. But the price never gets back to, or, or never goes to where it should be, we think. Right. That doesn't do us any good. It the does. value is it, so it, amazing. It can do us a lot of good, actually. All right. Oh. I throw my hands Take up. a deep breath. Because you're now starting to wander into an 
unfamiliar country of Warren Buffett style investing. We're starting to get down to it here. And it's going to be very unfamiliar. In a lot of ways, it's going to be very non-intuitive. So when I say things like, we want to buy a company that's 50% discount to its real value, and we really may not care that it ever goes back up there in terms of price. That's very non-intuitive. you got to be sitting there thinking, how the hell do you make any money if it, it doesn't go back up? It, that is an excellent point. Okay. <laughs> so, and we're going to learn that. That's not going to be what we talk about in this next 10 minutes. Yeah. But we are going to learn that. And it's going to be awesome when I start to reveal some of the major secrets that Buffett has that allow him to have a company like we were talking about, Seize Candy. Oh, I know what you're going to say. That produces $65 million dividends. a year. That's how you never sell it and you still make money. You're just, money's pouring in. So, but it starts with... I love how you totally event. made a secret out of that for the last 40 minutes. Like, oh no, there's a way to make money without ever selling and I'm not going to tell you what it is. It's dividends. Jeez. We're buying companies as if we're the only owner in the business. We're going to think exactly like that. And why is that? Well, because we, we've got a model for us to follow of the richest man in the world who did that. And he bought some companies 100% and he bought some companies a quarter of a percent. But he did it exactly the same way. Treat it the same way. So we should do that too. That would make sense, right? Yes. Well, now that I have come up with the answer to that particular math problem, um, it makes a lot more sense. Okay, then I promise I give you, you... no credit for telling me that answer. <laughs> well, we've sort of gotten our way through the management numbers here. Okay, but wait, you haven't told me the last R for ruler. Okay, we'll do that and then we got to go on. Yeah. All right, so... E is event, and we got to know that it's an event that doesn't change the value, but does change the price. Okay. Okay. So we're looking for an event that that is perfect, and we'll go into those next time. Um, and the R is how to take dividends and buybacks from the company, and reduce your basis in the company. How to get your money off the table, so that the overall rate of return doesn't depend on the market price at all. That's going to be killer. So, so what we're does R stand that. for? Reduce? R is for reduce basis. Reduce basis. Yep, reduce basis. And we got to go. We do. All right. Whew. We got to go. All right. Next time, we're diving into event and how to value a business. We're going to be in this one for a while because this is where the rubber meets the road and where we're taking you down the rabbit hole. Yeah, I think we should push our portfolio allocation discussion off off a bit that feels like like secondary to yeah. understanding what i should actually put in the portfolio <laughs> not to worry right now about this <laughs> yeah but as a hint for portfolio we're going to we're going to target in our lifetime buying about 20 companies over our entire lives over our lives that sounds good that cuts down on fees doesn't it oh yeah cuts down on fees like cuts that. down on work cuts down on all kinds of things so that, that should give you a hint about portfolio allocation. We'll see how that goes later. We'll get back to them. And we're going to come back to this podcast next time with event, which is where the rubber meets the road. And it's going to be exciting. We're going to talk about valuing a business. Okay. Until then, time okay. to go play. Bye. See ya. Hey, you guys. Thanks for listening to Invested, the rule number one podcast. If you like us, please subscribe. Please and leave a review for us on iTunes. Uh, by the way, you can get our notes and links for this podcast and post comments about this show and uh, also get more information about how to invest on your own by going to investedpodcast.com. Um, by the way, everything, this is important, everything discussed on this show is either my opinion or Danielle's opinion and it isn't to be taken as investment advice because I am not your investment advisor nor have I considered your personal situation as your fiduciary. This podcast is for entertainment and education only. I, I gotta tell you, I really hope you enjoyed it. And I know Danielle does too. So until next week, it's time to go play. See ya.